Welcome everyone Center Weekly Colloquium. This week we have uh, Dr. Jeremiah Fasano, a senior policy advisor from the Office of Food Additive Safety and the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition at the USDA. And Dr. Fasano has worked on a variety of issues during his time at the Center for Food Safety, including pre-market safety evaluation of new food ingredients, assessment of genetically engineered new plant varieties, strategies for tracking sodium reduction in the U.S. food supply, and development of safety assessment frameworks for new food technologies and functionalities. He received his doctorate in plant cell physiology and molecular biology from Pennsylvania State University. So welcome, Dr. Fasano. Thank you for coming today. And I am going to put this over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Jeremiah Fasano. Um, as uh, Don mentioned, I work at the Office of Food Additive Safety at FDA's Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. My talk today is mostly basically about how we handle innovations in new food technologies. And I'll use genetic engineering as an example and a few other technologies, but this really applies more broadly. And so that's sort of part of the theme of the talk today is to illustrate um, as new technologies come along, how we address them. So innovations are ongoing. We've been seeing them for, for many decades, um, new ways of producing food, um, new kinds of food, uh, and we expect to continue to see these. And FDA's approach to dealing with this is really to use our longstanding authorities and combine them with detailed scientific analysis of new technologies so we can figure out the best way to effectively apply those authorities. And as I said, I'll be talking about that um, using a couple of case studies for illustration today. As a brief overview, uh, I'll spend some time first talking about food safety itself, the definitions, uh, the tools we have available, the programs we have. Uh, this part uh, may seem a little bit dry, um, something only bureaucrat could love, but uh, it is important because it helps set some context for how we apply those tools in the real world in the two case studies I'll discuss. First, food safety then. So a little bit about our office. Um, this is the Office of Food Additive Safety. It is our job to ensure that anything that is added to food is safe and lawful. We operate a lot of uh, programs, petition programs, certification programs, consultation programs. We work with other federal, state, and local agencies on a variety of topics. We have a lot of different kinds of scientists on staff. We have chemists, toxicologists, molecular biologists, microbiologists, um, a variety of disciplines because there's a lot of different kinds of issues that come up and so we need to be prepared to address all of them. Since I've mentioned the Office of Food Editor Safety a couple of times now, it might be worth taking a moment to stop and talk about what actually is a food additive. So this is the definition, any substance the intended use of which results or may reasonably be expected to result in becoming a component or otherwise affecting the characteristic of any food. This is a very broad definition. And so the, the number of potential things that our office could look at is very broad. Uh, this also includes substances used in producing and packaging uh, food. So it, this, this, this is a, a very broad um, scope for FDA's authority in overseeing food additives. I'll give you a few examples just to ground the concept. Uh, this includes familiar things like sweeteners and flavors. Um, it also includes things with technical effects in the food like um, you know, emulsifiers or stabilizers. But then, as I mentioned, it also includes things that come into contact with food, things like paper and plastics. So these are all things that we would look at uh, under our food additive authority. Uh, the concept of a food additive and all of our other tools and authorities really come from the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which does a lot of different things. It defines the concept of a food additive, um, and as well as an exemption for generally recognized the safe status, which I'll talk about in a minute, it defines prohibited acts. These are the things you're not allowed to do in food, including adulterating a food. Again, something I'll come back to in a little bit. Um, it establishes pre-market approval for new uses of food additives, uh, establishes the standard of review and the standard of safety, and also rulemaking procedures for when FDA does do formal approvals for food additives. Let me talk now a little bit about the food additive versus grass concept. So under the act, uh, anything that you add to food has to be approved as a food additive um, again, this is a very broad concept. Any substance intended use which may result or reasonably be expected to result in becoming a component of food or affecting its characteristics. But 
Congress added a specific qualifier. If the substance is generally recognized among experts qualified by scientific training and experience to evaluate safety, it's being shown to be safe under the intended conditions of use. So uh, the intent here is that uh, FDA uh, should not be using public health resources to evaluate the safety of substances, which the scientific community on the basis of public data has already concluded are safe. So food additives are subject to pre-market review and approval by FDA. Um, and if there is a successful food additive petition, it, it results in a regulation, which goes in the Code of Federal Regulations. So there's a positive list of essentially all approved food additives. For generally recognized as safe ingredient uses or grass ingredient uses, they are exempt from the pre-market approval requirements, again, because the scientific community on the basis of public data has already judged the use to be safe. Uh, we do have some regulations uh, for grass substances. We do have an inventory um, under one of our notification programs, but there is no single complete list because, again, this is um, sort of a condition that's defined by uh, available information and the views of the scientific community. Uh, to put this another way, the safety data that you need is going to be the same regardless. If you don't have the safety data, you know, you, you, you just stop there. Um, but if you do have safety data, then the question becomes, what is the status of that data? Is that publicly available? Does, does the scientific community uh, know about that data, familiar with it, accept it as evidence of safety? Um, if yes, then it's a potential candidate for grass status. Uh, if no, then it would need to be approved by FDA as a food additive. In other words, because the scientific community is not familiar with the data and is not um, convinced of safety on that basis, you need to bring it to FDA so that FDA scientists can formally approve it on the basis of that data, again, if the data is adequate. Let's move on to safety. Um, this definition of, in the context of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act is reasonable certainty in the minds of competent scientists. Um, Congress's perspective is that Absolute safety is not really uh, practically feasible. It is not something that is uh, capable of proof using the scientific method. Um, and also that safety centers around the conditions of use, um, in part because of uh, how much is involved in the use, something we'll talk about in a minute here. But the basic concept here is that safety in terms of food ingredients is reasonable certainty of no harm in the minds of competent scientists under certain conditions of use. The picture there is a uh, Paracelsus. Um, a, an eminent scientist of the, uh, um, I believe the 1600s, who initially formulated the concept that the dose makes the poison. Um, and that's something that we think about a lot in terms of exposure and safety. So in terms of how we actually approach safety assessment, let me kind of walk through this a little bit. Uh, the identity of the substance is obviously critical. You need to know what you're actually evaluating. So you need to define identity. Uh, and then you also need to understand how much people are likely to be exposed to as a result of the intended use. So this is one of the reasons why say, the concept of intended use is so central to safety. It's not, safety is not intrinsic property of a substance. Safety is the property of a substance at a particular level of use or exposure. And so that's another key component for the safety assessment. Another important thing we need to understand is the relevant properties of the substance, uh, the kinds of information that you might want about, say, a, an enzyme versus a small chemical versus a fiber uh, are very different. And so the properties really drive the appropriate data. And then the appropriate data is what helps you establish the safety under certain conditions of use. So it's this sort of four-step process. You think about what the substance is, how much of it people are going to be exposed to, what the properties are of the substance. And we know a lot about a lot of different kinds of properties of substances now. Um, there's a lot of tools to sort of think about that. And then finally, based on all those considerations, what is the appropriate data? Another way of formulating it is really these four core questions. What is it? What's it going to be used for? How much will people consume? And what amounts uh, will the amounts that you expect to be consumed, are they going to be safe? Um, and we'll be revisiting this, these questions uh, a little bit later on, but I just wanted to sort of touch on them here. Uh, in terms of how much people are going to be exposed to, and maybe stop and take a moment to talk about that. And so we think about what food categories the substance will be used in, how much is needed for the technical effect, um, and how much will people eat? There's a lot of data on sort of consumption that lets us estimate that. So for example, uh, believe it or not, consumers eat about 17 grams of uh, barbecue flavored potato chips every day. That's about a third of a 1.5 ounce bag. 
So things like that help us understand how much people are likely to be exposed to from a particular set of intended uses. And again, you know, in terms of thinking about the data you might want, that's really going to be driven both by the exposure, but also by the properties of the substance itself. So that's some background about how we think about safety assessment. Um, again, we'll loop back to some of this a little bit later, but that sort of provides some context. Now I'll uh, talk about the first case study, which is applying FDA authorities to regulate genetically engineered plant foods. As some of you may be aware, in the U.S., we have something called a coordinated framework. This basically divides up the responsibilities between different federal agencies for oversight of genetically engineered plants. Uh, EPA is, has oversight of uh, pesticides, including pesticides that are incorporated into genetically engineered plants. Um, USDA has oversight over environmental aspects of genetically engineered plants, including protecting agriculture from uh, weeds uh, and uh, weed traits. And then FDA has the responsibility to ensure that food from genetically engineered plants is safe and nutritious for humans and animals. What this really comes down to is that foods from genetically engineered plants have to meet the same legal requirements as all other foods. Um, if you think back to what I was talking about with the, um, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and some of the responsibilities and requirements that establishes of uh, one prohibited act under the um, under the act is that uh, food can't be adulterated. That means it can't contain unapproved food additives. Um, it can't contain substances um, that are harmful uh, at a, a particular level, um, including poisonous and deleterious substances. Um, it also has to be labeled in a, in a truthful and non-misleading way. I won't talk so much about labeling, but I want to mention that for completeness here. So starting from that point, uh, that basic point that Food from genetically engineered plants, like all other foods, has to meet the requirements of the act. FDA uh, developed a statement of policy um, describing how the agency was going to regulate uh, these kinds of foods. Uh, the policy describes safety and regulatory considerations for new plant varieties. Um, it proposed approaches for consultation with the agency. But the bottom line is that existing laws and regulations are sufficient to ensure the safety of food from these plants. You don't need special laws or regulations. You need the same tools and the same considerations that you would come up with for any new plant variety or any new food. So to walk through that a little bit, um, the policy noted that any plant breeding method can alter levels of key components. Uh, the plants make a lot of different toxins and anti-nutrients to prevent them from being eaten by animals and insects. Uh, in conventional varieties that are used for food production, those are very low levels, but they're still there. And so it's important to understand whether those levels have changed in any new variety, make sure they continue to be at safe levels. And also, uh, if it's a source of key nutrients, that's something you want to understand. So the policy says, okay, take a look at that. You know, Are these levels comparable or have they changed? If they have, you might need additional information characterizing to think specifically about the safety and nutritional consequences. In addition, if you actually added um, some new component, whether you've outcrossed from a wild relative or you've genetically engineered it in, um, are the levels of the new or altered components relevant for safety? Again, if they are, if you're seeing a level you haven't previously seen or you're seeing a new substance, you may need additional information to um, kind of come to a resolution on the safety question. So to talk through this in a little more detail, um, you need to understand if you have introduced something new, um, if you uh, introduce new DNA and that expresses a protein, um, check to take a look at that. But it's also worth keeping in mind that uh, many times when you genetically engineer a plant, uh, the new substance is not actually being expressed in the food. It might be expressed in the leaves or the roots or something else that's not necessarily being eaten. Um, so that's the first thing to check is to see if it is present in the food. Um, if it is, uh, if it's a protein, it, what do we know about it? Is it from an allergenic source? Um, is it uh, similar to known protein toxins? Again, we have a lot of information about these properties that help us assess that. Um, if it's a non-protein substance, is it something where there's some sort of toxicological signal we would need to be concerned about? Again, if the answers to these questions are no, um, then you generally you're not gonna have a safety issue, but if they are, you might need to investigate further, do more characterization, or potentially do more studies. And then finally, for anything that you have added to the plant um, through genetic engineering or any other method, uh, the data and information that tell you about the safety of the product, are they publicly available? 
Um, you could do these kinds of safety studies and not publish them. There may be you know, proprietary data, but if they're published um, and if there's a consensus among experts that the, the studies show that the use is safe, um, then you're not going to require pre-market approval. It would qualify for a grass exemption. If that data is um, not publicly available, or if there's a dispute among experts in the scientific community about the significance of the data, you might be looking at something that would require pre-market approval as a food additive. So let's talk through this um, in a little more detail with some specific examples. Um, again, the Act applies and the requirements of the Act apply to food from GE plants just like everything else. Um, if there's an endogenous substance expressed in the plant, for example, potatoes, uh, potatoes make a glycoalkaloid called solanine, which is toxic. Again, the point of this is the potato doesn't want to be eaten and is trying to prevent uh, animals and insects and uh, other, other uh, things from eating the potato. Um, this, is, this is why uh, you shouldn't eat potatoes that have turned green is because they're starting to upregulate their solanine production. Uh, and it's something you can definitely uh, be harmed by if the levels are too high. So when you're making a new potato variety, you need to check the solanine levels and make sure that they're not present at levels higher than historically safely consumed. We know uh, through extensive experience that very low levels of solanine in a potato are not going to be harmful. Um, and you, for any new variety, you would not say that there needs to be no solanine because, again, potatoes have low levels of solanine in them, but you want to make sure the levels are not higher than historically consumed. The way that we, we look at these kinds of questions is often through something called compositional assessment. You have your new variety. Um, you know the key nutrients that are in it. You know anti-nutrients that are present in it, uh, toxicants that are in it. And so you compare it to a closely related variety um, to see what kind of composition you might see there as sort of a reference or, or, or a check. Uh, you would also look at data from other varieties. It's not important just to understand uh, how much might be in a close relative, but what kinds of levels do you see in varieties that are commonly consumed that are in commercial production? And, and then finally, um, you might look at other comparable foods or similar foods that have similar kind of biochemistry, again, to see um, what information is available on substances that are present there and what the ranges are. Um, Again, you know, plants make a lot of different kinds of substances, and really, uh, in this case, we're thinking a lot about exposure. Low levels of exposure to something cannot could be uh, a non-issue, but high levels, uh, unexpected levels that um, might be a safety problem, that's true both of uh, uh, conventional new plant varieties as well as ones created through genetic engineering or other biotechnologies. So that's the endogenous substances. You're looking to see if you see any changes there. And the other piece of this is to think about added substances, which, again, they have to be uh, generally recognized as safe or require pre-market approval by FDA. So uh, you know, the test here is, is the information publicly available? Is it widely accepted by experts? Um, you can get approval by FDA as a food additive if you can convince FDA scientists of safety. Uh, but if you've already convinced the scientific community, uh, then you may not need to do that. So let's take, for example, um, a glyphosate tolerant corn, right? So this is corn, which has had introduced a protein called 5 enyl pyruval shikimate 5 phosphate synthase, which, you know, sounds a little long and complicated, but essentially it's an enzyme that's involved in amino acid metabolism. Um, and the variety that plants make um, is susceptible to uh, the herbicide um, glyphosate. Uh, there's another version of this, this enzyme, which is produced by microbes, which is not um, disrupted by glyphosate. And so if you add this protein to the crop, then it becomes toler tolerant to the herbicide um, and you can use, um, use it without worrying about damaging the, the food crop that you're making. So then the question is, is this protein that you're adding something that would qualify uh, for grass status or is it something that would require pre-market uh, approval? So we actually know a great deal about this particular protein, um, as well as the uh, sort of related versions that are present in, present in plants. Um, there are peer-reviewed toxicology studies that show that it's um, safe. It doesn't produce toxicity. It doesn't have uh, any sort of sequence similarity to known allergens or toxins. Um, and, you know, this data is all public, and there's no dispute about it in the scientific community. And so, again, this is something that would be a strong candidate for grass status for this use given the public availability of the information uh, and the lack of uh, uh, dispute about the significance of that data. But 
it depends on the properties of the substance that you're adding. If it's something where you don't have a lot of data, if it's something where you get a complex um, uh, you know, toxicology signal, you could be in a very different scenario. So just to recap, you know, when you're looking at a new plant variety, especially when it's genetically engineered, think about the endogenous substances, are those levels um, you know, comparable to existing levels? Is there anything that would be potentially harmful at a certain level? Uh, you look at the added substances and you think about the available safety data and scientific consensus. Um, and then also you can consider labeling questions. And the act applies to these foods just as it does to all others. So the policy recommends consultation with FDA to resolve safety and regulatory questions uh, before marketing. Um, and by, by having these discussions, we can ensure that no crop that comes to market contains unapproved food additives um, or is otherwise adulterated in a way that would be harmful. We have this consultation program that's been running for um, over 20 years. Uh, and essentially this process checks for compliance with these mandatory requirements of the act. Uh, the approach that we use is consistent with international standards. Um, we essentially have comprehensive participation in the industry um, because the industry knows the importance of uh, being able to say that FDA doesn't have uh, any questions about regulatory status. We've evaluated over 180 genetically engineered plant lines under this process. We post all the consultations on our website, um, as, as some of you may already uh, be familiar with. And, um, you know, so you can just go and look and see the kinds of, uh, you know, issues we look at, the data we look at, um, that's all sort of out there and available for people to consider. One sort of point I want to touch on here, and this goes back to our general theme of how FDA deals with innovations in food technology and food production, is genome editing. So uh, this is a, a newer technology some of you may be familiar, familiar with. Um, essentially involves uh, nucleases, which allow um, scientists to target very specific pieces of DNA, uh, cut them out, and sort of edit them. Uh, earlier technologies uh, weren't really specific about where you would insert into the genome. In this case, you can look for a specific sequence in the genome um, and then go in and make edits there, whether you're knocking out a gene or replacing it or altering some specific piece of it. Um, you know, there's things like zinc finger, finger nucleases, uh, talons, um, CRISPR-Cas, uh, you know, so these, these technologies, which are in the news a lot and people are sort of talking about, um, and again, they've been used in animal science for a long time and they're being now applied uh, more and more to development of new plant varieties. And so, um, you know, given that I've been talking about the 92 policy document, which was developed before any of these technologies really anyone even considered deploying uh, for development of new plant varieties, is that policy still applicable? Does it still make sense? Well, you know, as I said, FDA regulates essentially all food for safety, regardless of how the plant varieties are bred. Um, so the 92 policy is not built on a specific way of developing a new plant variety. Um, and U.S. food safety requirements don't depend on whether or not uh, any particular biotechnology is used. They're about the properties of the food. Um, and because of this broad approach and the focus on the characteristics of the food product, rather than the method itself, this policy really um, continues to apply equally well for uh, new varieties that are made through genome editing as through uh, more traditional forms of biotechnology. And we still uh, continue to offer consultations for developers um, of these kinds of new varieties. In fact, we uh, here's an example of a genome edited trait for which we completed a consultation. Uh, this was a soybean with increased levels of oleic acid. And our consultation process and the kind of information we looked at really looked very similar to what we, the kinds of questions we would ask um, for uh, any uh, you know, genetically engineered new plant variety. Because again, the questions that are important are about the properties of the food and the method of manufacture, the process for producing uh, this new plant variety is important insofar as it informs us about the properties of the food, which is the thing um, that is really sort of the focus of our, our interest. So kind of to close out this case study, you can see that um, the 92 policy is a great example of our basic approach, which is to use these core authorities we have, um, use our, the best available science to understand um, the details of any new production method, and then use that understanding to apply those authorities, uh, focusing again on the properties of the food and not in any particular uh, implementation of the technology. So that's plant biotech. Um, I, I see I've... Uh, I'll start talking a little faster because I, I see we're um, 
run a little low on time. The second case study is about new production uh, processes. Uh, it's sort of inspired by and informed by nanotechnology, but it, it's broader than that. So let's let's return first to these these basic questions about the safety assessment I talked about earlier. Um, you know, these are the four questions that help define the scope of the safety safety assessment and the kind of data and information that we're going to need. And in the context of nanotechnology, so this is you know in context of food, it's an emerging technology can be used in food manufacturing um, and products with nanoscale attributes. They may differ from conventionally manufactured products. Um, there are many different sort of instances of this. One uh, sort of easy to understand one is that depending on the particle size, um, something like, for example, a gold particle may have different color uh, depending on the size of the particle. And so, you know, things like color, uh, things like absorption or metabolism can differ a lot depending on the physical size of the the particles of the substance. Um, FDA doesn't. You know, categorically judge anything produced by nanotechnology as intrinsically benign or harmful. Um, as with all food products, you're probably starting to get tired of hearing me say this, but it's really about the characteristics of the finished product and the safety of the intended use. Uh, FDA actually released some guidance on this a few years ago, you know, again, inspired by nanotechnology, but not limited to it, acknowledging any manufacturing change has the potential to be significant. This remains true for novel products um, or novel uh, you know, food production technologies like nanotechnology, um, but you know it's it it's still really about the characteristics of the food. Um, and but the, the guidance does note that if you do change the properties of the food substance, you may need different or additional data. Um, if if you've changed, you know, if you have something that is a nanoscale particle. Um, and it changes absorption or metabolism, or it changes some other physical property, or it changes the way it's taken up in the body, um, then you might need additional data, or you might need data that helps you translate your sort of existing studies to this new um, sort of physical structure of the substance. So again, thinking about it in terms of our, our four core questions, if you have used a new process to make something with different physical parameters, uh, the identity in some respects has changed, the manufacturing process has changed, um, you may use it for different purposes in different food categories. And again, if it has a different color or, or different physical properties, it might open up to a different range of, of uses in food. And so that's something else we would need to think about. And then finally, um, you know, you would want to make sure that you have the appropriate data given any changes in the properties of the substance. The guidance also talked about some historical examples, which I'll just touch on briefly here, just to kind of illustrate the, the continuity. Um, so these three are... Uh, chymosin, xanthan gum, and tartaric acid. Uh, chymosin is actually an, an enzyme um, that is uh, traditionally derived from the stomach lining of animals. It's used to make cheese. It helps break down casein to coagulate it to sort of form the cheese. Um, manufacturers were interested in uh, alternative sources of, of chymosin, uh, and one thing that they hit on was essentially to genetically engineer yeast to express the animal chymosin. They harvest it from the, from the yeast you know, fermentation and then use that as their enzyme to coagulate the cheese. Um, so that's sort of a significant manufacturing change to get a similar um, substance. Xanthan gum is another one. This is something that you get essentially by fermentate, bacterial fermentation. Um, you add some simple sugars, it makes this gum. It can be used as sort of a texturizer or a thickener. Um, and originally, uh, the process was developed through purification of the xanthan gum with isopropyl alcohol. Um, and then later, manufacturers explored using ethanol or ethyl alcohol to do the purification. So that's something else where you've you got a similar substance, uh, but you're doing a different manufacturing step to, to get to it. And then finally, tartaric acid. Um, this is something where uh, traditionally you get it as a byproduct of wine manufacture. So some of the leftover uh, residue, the leaves, um, you can get tartaric acid out of that. And that can be useful for a variety of things. It adds sour uh, flavor to foods. Um, you can combine it with a sodium bicarbonate to get a uh, baking, baking powder. Um, and so, uh, Folks later developed a, a method of producing this by enzymatic synthesis rather than serve as a byproduct extract from, from winemaking. So returning to our four questions, I'm going to start thinking about them. In terms of the chymosin, right, if you're getting it from, from animals versus microbial manufacture, you know, the identity of the core enzyme is the same, but uh, you know, potential uh, impurities that might come along with it um, are going to be very different because of the source. And so when you're characterizing the identity, you want to be thinking about those potential impurities and making sure that none of those have any sort of meaningful impact on the safety. And you might need to look for different things in, in those cases. Um, in terms of the xanthan gum, 
Um, again, you know, you're, you're using a different kind of alcohol to do the purification. Whenever you do a purification step, um, you're going to bring certain impurities along at certain levels. If you're, if you're modifying that, then you might need to look for different impurities um, or you might need to look um, more carefully at the specific levels. Um, you know, in order to understand something like this, you need to understand the biology of the bacterium that you're using for the fermentation, um, you know, which we did. And you would also need to understand something about the basic chemistry of uh, isopropyl alcohol versus ethanol uh, and how that affects um, sort of the, the precipitation of, of your um, substance of interest. So again, these are things that are knowable, but you need to think to look for them, which is why you need to go back and re-examine the manufacturing process whenever you change it to think about what might happen. Uh, and then finally, the um, tartaric acid example. You know, again, here, you know, if you're isolating something from a uh, uh, from you know wine winemaking, then there's a certain set of residues that are going to come along. If you're doing it through enzymatic synthesis, there might be other ones, and you would need to look specifically at um, what might be carried along in the in the case of the enzyme. You know what might be sort of an alternative uh, synthesis target or sort of like a low level byproduct that might come along with it, and make sure that none of those differences are meaningful for safety. So these are sort of some, some historical examples uh, where you know the agency laid out. You know, we, we have looked at manufacturing process changes in the past, and, you know, it's it's all about looking at the specific details and understanding the potential consequences for the properties of the food. You know, some more recent examples that are kind of interesting. Uh, one of them is ice structure and protein. So this is a protein that's actually made in cold water fish that helps keep ice crystals from forming in their tissues. Um, and uh, a company was interested in using this uh, in frozen desserts and in sort of frozen sauces and in, in frozen meals. Um, again, for the same purpose, and so expressed it transgenically uh, in yeast. Um, another example is stevia glycosides. Uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with stevia as a sweetener, um, the, the sort of plant which I believe grows in Paraguay. Um, sort of the crude extracts from that uh, uh, had some, some sort of significant concerns in terms of toxicology signals. Um, folks later developed much purer extracts that didn't have those kinds of safety concerns. And then even later than that, reconstructed the biosynthetic pathway for the stevia glycosides um, in, in, a, in a fungus, actually, to be able to produce it from a microbial source. And then finally, beta-lactoglobulin. This is a, a, a major milk protein, um, so it's found in milk. Uh, and recently, um, uh, folks developed a way to produce it uh, at scale um, from a transgenic uh, fungus, so producing this milk protein from a fungus. And so these are all, you know, again, examples of where you've got a similar substance, but you're obtaining it in a, in a different way through a different manufacturing process. So let's return to our questions and think about that a little bit. Um, again, in all these cases, uh, you would start out thinking about identity, um, just in terms of even the, the DNA sequence and the protein sequence of the present sort of in the original source and, and how they're present in the, in the transgenic source, just to confirm you're thinking about the same thing. Um, but in all these cases, really, um, a lot of it is about uh, potential impurities that might come along from the production process. Are any of those different and would those matter? Ice structure and protein is interesting in this way because the source is a major allergen, right? Uh, fish is a, is a major allergen for many people. And so if you're um, going to have a fish protein, uh, you want to make sure that it isn't a major allergen. Um, so where if you, if you sort of extracted it from fish, you would have lots of sort of impurities, residues, other proteins that would come along, some of which might be the major allergens. Uh, but in terms of the protein expressed in yeast, um, you know, they were able to generate and publish data showing that fish allergic people did not respond to this protein, that it was not a major fish allergen, um, and that, you know, no other fish proteins were expressed by this process. It was just a single sequence expressed in the yeast. Um, of course, we also, you know, in that case would look at potential uh, impurities produced by the yeast fermentation, but, you know, yeast uh, fermentation is something we're familiar with. Uh, long history of use in food production, so we know a lot about the kinds of things that can actually be produced. In general, they don't raise safety concerns. Um, talking about stevia, this is something where really um, sort of you get this refined extraction process from the plant. But again, you're always going to bring um, you know substances along when you do a purification. It's never 100. percent And so, and you also will still have a, a fairly complex mixture of a number of different uh, stevial glycosides. Um, and this is one of the reasons that. Um, folks move to trying to produce individual stevial glycosides through microbial um, uh, uh, genetic engineering. And so in this case, you know, for the plant extracted version, there's going to be potential impurities you would look at, especially given the, uh, the earlier uh, crude extracts, tox problems, you would want to make sure that you aren't bringing along anything of concern. Uh, in the mi microbial um, synthesis case, 
then you have a different set of residues. Again, you know, for yeast uh, or any sort of commonly used fungus uh, in food production where you have a lot of experience, those residues are generally not going to be a concern. Um, and then you're really focusing just sort of on the safety of the individual substance that's being expressed. And then finally, the uh, beta-lactoglobulin. Um, this is uh, sort of an interesting contrast to the, um, to the ice structure in protein. This, this is a, a protein from milk, so it's a major allergenic source, but it is actually an allergenic protein from milk. And so you would need to label it appropriately um, because it is actually one of the major allergens in milk. Um, but other than that, you know, you would look at identity and compare them to make sure there were no differences that you would need to address or have any concerns about. Again, in terms of the resolution of production platform, those are things that, you know, we have a lot of experience with and not really a lot of concerns with in terms of um, introducing potential safety concerns. So to finally wrap up, um, I just want to sort of, you know, reiterate that this sort of shows the consistent approach the agency has taken over time, that when we see manufacturing process changes, um, we, we just try to understand how that impacts the properties of the food. Um, and in general, it is, um, you know, quite possible to understand those potential implications. As in my example with the isopropyl versus ethyl uh, alcohol, um, you know, you can use basic chemistry to understand what things might or might not be purified in that process and what you might need to look at. Um, and then once you've identified those differences, you think about what potential significance they might have for safety. Um, and the information you need to establish safety could change. Uh, if the process changes and it results in changes to those properties. So it's it's really um, sort of on a case-by-case -case basis, but it's something the agency has been doing consistently as we see new innovations in food production technology from things that are as, as sort of, you know, pedestrian as uh, isopropyl versus ethyl alcohol and purification to uh, expressing, um, you know, a fish or, or milk protein um, via uh, genetic engineering and yeast and, and sort of isolating that for use in food. But the principle is, is very similar. So, you know, sort of as my parting thought, I'll just leave you with this idea that, you know, we are continuing to see these innovations in science and technology. And FDA strategy, rather than trying to develop um, sort of prescriptive requirements for individual technologies, which will inevitably sort of fall out of use and become um, outmoded as innovation continues, is to use current science to understand the implications of any new technology for the properties of the food that might be produced by it. And then use our longstanding authorities applied effectively, given that understanding, to make sure that the food is safe. And the, the virtue of this approach is its flexibility, the way that it is adaptable to a wide variety of new food production technologies as they emerge, as they evolve, as they iterate. Um, so as, this, as sort of the industry uh, continues to move um, and as science continues to develop, FDA can move with it. And so I expect that we'll continue to use this approach uh, to ensure oversee future innovations uh, and support our ongoing responsibility to make sure that the U.S. food supply is safe. With that, I will wrap up the presentation section. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Jeremiah. Uh, we haven't had many representatives from governmental agencies this semester, so it's very helpful for us and students to understand how foods get regulated and also to start thinking about novel food technologies and, and food safety or safety for the public. So thank you for that presentation. Um, I see that you stopped sharing your screen. You probably haven't seen that the uh, chat box has been blowing up with comments and questions for you. So I thought maybe it'd be good for you to be able to take a look at the chat box and we can um, go in order of some of the questions if you would like to be able to read them out loud. And um, also if some of the public people would like to raise their hands in the participant box, if you wanna ask a question as well, we can continue that way. So are you able to access the chat box? Are you able to see that? Jeremy? Yeah, I can see the chat box. I also see one of my colleagues has been in there answering some questions. <laughs> so I'll need to just kind of sort through and see which ones Carrie has already addressed and which ones she hasn't. Um, okay. Great. And in the meantime, if there are participants that want to raise their hand to ask questions as well, please go ahead and, and do that on the participant box. Okay. Um, I'm going to, okay. I see I answered accidentally answered Joanna's question. Um, it's good. Um, uh, okay. I'll start with, uh, the first one from, uh, Allison, uh, which is about the, the kind of analysis that we do for traditionally bred varieties versus those produced with genetic engineering. So the policy, um, applies to all new plant varieties, essentially in, in terms of the concept that you walk through, are you getting over expression of some endogenous substance or you introduce something new? Um, and the recommendation is essentially any developer of a new crop should do this analysis because you want to be sure that you haven't made your food illegal 
right? Essentially, if it's got an unapproved mm-hmm. food additive or if it's got something that adulterates the food, it's illegal under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. It can be seized. You know, it can be you know, all sorts of litigation, uh, you know, enforcement actions and so forth. So we offer the consultation to any developer um, who wants to do it to make sure that they are in compliance with the law. And so, uh, again, the consultation process is voluntary. Compliance with the law is not. In practice, mm-hmm. that has essentially meant that the consultations we do are with developers of new genetically engineered plant varieties because they perhaps feel the strongest pressure to be able to say, we've talked to FDA, we don't have any unapproved food additives or anything else that would adulterate the food. Uh, but conceptually, the process applies to any new plant variety. Um, and you know, we could potentially do a consultation, again, not dependent on the specific technology, but simply on uh, the degree to which a developer um, you know, wants to be sure that they haven't done something that would make their food uh, illegal. I was thinking specifically of um, the Lenape potato, which was bred in the 70s for disease resistance and chipping content and then later withdrawn because it was found to have like a high glycoalkaloid content. So I was wondering if we would be able to catch that type of situation sooner um, with the way things are set up now. Yeah, I mean, so I think one of the values of the policy, again, is that um, because it applies more broadly. And so this is something that, you know, many a lot of the things that are in the policy are essentially things that, that um, you know, uh, breeders were doing anyway, but maybe they weren't all doing as as um, kind of thoroughly or aggressively as, as perhaps they could have. And so I think, you know, modern breeding technologies, regardless of whether or not they use genetic engineering, are very mindful of, of sort of the decision tree and the thought process that are described in the policy. And if you follow something like that, you're not going to get the kind of issue that you would see from that that example in, in the 70s with the high glycoalkaloid potato. Um, in fact, I think you know things like that were really a cautionary example to breeders to more clearly follow um, the sort of decision tree process that we mapped out in the 92 policy. Okay, um, next one from Jason. What is the consequence of the FDA consultation being voluntary? Um, I. We're not aware, I think, at this point of any um, genetically engineered food crop that has been intentionally commercialized in the U.S. where they haven't participated in the consultation. That includes both um, domestic and foreign developers. So uh, at the present time, you know, this is really sort of working effectively as a policy to serve our ultimate goal, which is to make sure that new varieties with unapproved food additives or other things that might be harmful are not present in them. That's really sort of the focus from a, a policy perspective. Um, and that is, um, we feel working uh, pretty well right now, um, given the approach that we have, because we are getting broad participation from industry, both uh, domestic and uh, international. Andy had a similar question about domestication. Now, that's interesting. Does this process bottleneck the introduction of new crops into the market? Um, I think in general, um, this is not sort of a practical bottleneck. So genuinely new crop varieties, um, uh, things that sort of we haven't had any experience with in the U.S. Uh, Generally, you have had experience with uh, whatever part of the world they're originally domesticated in. Um, Genuinely new, um, you know, agricultural crops that that haven't been consumed before are are extremely rare. I I don't think that this is actually uh, a practical issue. That said, um, you know, if you are introducing a new variety, um, this same kind of thought process could apply. It might be a little more challenging in terms of the comparative analysis. You might need to go a little more broadly to understand for the things that you identify in that food, what other places they might be present in the food supply. Again, if they're not, if something is present in food um, and uh, you know there is no previous exposure and there's not a lot of information about safety, you potentially could be looking at um, you know a, a, a pre-market uh, approval situation but it really depends on the available knowledge and information. I don't think in practice it's been a significant issue. Um, From Jennifer, consumption studies over a long-term period, usually part of the voluntary process. Um, In general, um, you know, consumption studies for the food are generally not a significant um, part of the process, in part because the analysis is on um, identifying whether for things that are already present in the food, whether the levels have changed, if they haven't, um, you know, and that's a, it's a pretty comprehensive analysis of composition. If those haven't changed, um, and if the substance that you've introduced into the food is something for which you have a lot of information about the toxicology and safety, 
um, then there's no real hypothesis to sort of explore there. Um, and so the focus is really in making sure that substances are added, um, meet this, the safety standards required for all substances added to food. Um, and again, for anything that's naturally present in the food, um, that it's present at, at sort of comparable or low levels to those already being consumed. Uh, so that really is sort of the way to, to address that issue and not really through long-term uh, consumption studies. And if folks, if folks who have asked questions want to like hop in an amplifier or whatever, please feel free to do so. I'm just sort of moving through them because I don't want to leave. I don't want to go so slowly. I don't have time to get to everyone's questions, but please do hop in if, if you if you want. Um, okay. Um, something from Jennifer, production process, ways of regulating and reviewing suggest the process does matter in affecting product. Um, this seems counter volunteer approach. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I would agree that process definitely can affect product. Um, but the lens through which we think of it as, um, what are the effects on the product uh, rather than sort of, um, a focus on the process. So things you mentioned like post-translational modification, um, you know, changes in expression, whatever, those are absolutely are things that, that could influence the properties of, of the food. Um, and you would sort of look to those to see if any of them would have significance for safety. Um, so definitely, I would agree that that process can affect the product. And one of the sort of themes of that second case study was really you need to look in any particular instance for a new um, you know process. What are potential things that that could arise that might affect properties? And if so, could any of them have an impact on safety? So I, I guess I, I would agree, at least in, in part. Okay, the EPA reviews uh, GE microbes used in production of food and any purpose through the microbial commercial activity notification process. This is interestingly part of chemical review. Does or so microbes are not required to submit NEPA review as they've been routinely used, but there are new microbes being used now for many food additives. How does FDA assess the, safe, the use of these new microbes? EPA does not look at their food safety. Well, I guess I would say that um, in general, we look at these the way that we would look at anything else that's being added to food. So obviously it's going to be affected by the specific thing you're looking at. If you're looking at a micro being directly added to food, um, you need to understand um, sort of the history of consumption of that microbe, sort of what other species it's related to. Um, does it produce any toxins? Is it, is it known to be pathogenic? Um, there are some well-established sort of decision trees for thinking about um, sort of new microbes or microbes that are going to be used in food. If they're being used as a biological production platform, um, then your questions become slightly different. You're still interested in, um, you know, are they known to make any toxins or anything else that might be a potential safety concern? Because that potentially could be a residue um, that's brought along when you sort of harvest the, the protein um, that's being expressed by that, by that microbe. Um, but again, most of the microbes that are used for food production are, you know, very benign with a long history of use in food, things like, you know, like yeast, um, and a, a couple of different fungi that have been used for enzyme production since like the 50s or 60s. But these are not sort of exotic microbes that people don't know a lot about. And so, you know, when you're looking at the safety of something produced by that, um, you do, you know, routinely think about potential residues. But in most cases, these aren't things that are really going to raise safety concerns. Uh, we have a lot of experience with the microbe itself. And then in terms of the substance, um, you know, you're just, you would characterize that as you would characterize any other sort of food ingredient, whether it's a protein or a small chemical entity or, what, or whatever. From Fred, what would be due diligence on the part of a developer in checking to see this new conventional plant variety a change in one of its many components? That's an interesting question. I don't know if I've quite thought about it in that way. I think I would just say that, you know, again, using the conceptual framework of the 92 policy, um, it's incumbent on anybody introducing a new plant variety to think sort of systematically about what kinds of substances um, that, you know, species is known to produce and which ones might you need to look at. I mean, there is a broad consensus for many um, kinds of crops about what are the key nutrients, anti-nutrients, toxins, um, uh, OECD um, uh, issues, um, you know, documents on that topic, and there are a number of other resources. So it's it's not like you're operating in a vacuum. For, you know, most crops, there's already like a broad understanding of these are the key things you would need to look at to ensure safety. Carrie, since since you're on, um, if, if you hear something where you want to amplify, you can just raise your hand and, and hop in as well. Um, Ray, this recent paper may provide insight in the breeding and screening process used for new varieties. Yeah, I don't think I've seen that one, but I'll, I'll definitely take a look. Thanks, Ray. Scott Shore. Is CISAN doing anything to gain broader public understanding and acceptance of this approach at a time 
and trust in our public institutions is being challenged. Well, um, I definitely, I would say that we do many presentations. Carrie certainly has done some and a number of other, my colleagues, just to share with folks sort of what we're doing. Uh, we do place uh, a greater and greater emphasis on sort of transparency and explaining in clear and accessible terms, you know, any sort of decisions or policies we adopt. Um, we you know, try to, to put that stuff on our website for folks to look at. Um, you know, we do do presentations at various meetings. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's an ongoing effort, um, but I think we really sincerely want people to understand sort of our thought process and the things we think, you know, are, are kind of key to look at so that kind of people can follow along with us and, and sort of, you know, see our reasoning and thinking both in specific cases and also in sort of broad outlines like the ones I've described today. Carrie just shared a paper. Excellent. Thank you, Carrie. Okay, Carrie added a link for the Feed Your Mind initiative to educate and inform interested consumers. Thank you, Carrie. I had forgotten about that, and that is an excellent um, resource for folks to understand what we're doing. Um, GES Center, can you talk about synthetic meats may or may not fall into these evaluations with thinking is of FDA on labeling these products as meat? I think I would say first that, um, as some of you may be aware, there was an agreement in March 2019 to share oversight um, of these products between FDA and USDA. Um, USDA has oversight of the marketing and labeling of products um, that are derived from livestock and poultry cells and also from catfish. Uh, so I think that labeling question would be something that um, could be best addressed to them. And they have made some public statements about it. Um, I think, you know, without speaking too much about um, sort of the, the details of the process, I think I would say that the broad themes I've outlined here of using our existing authorities and thinking about the potential um, effects of any particular process on the properties of the food are things that we would use in any new technology, uh, including this one. Okay, Carrie just said a curriculum for school teachers. Okay, great. I think I've actually gotten to the end of the questions. I was worried about, you know, not leaving time to, to address them. Any uh, sort of uh, final questions or thoughts? Um, I don't see any hands raised. Does anybody want to raise a hand and I can unmute you or type a question? We have one minute left. That was pretty, thank you, Jeremiah. That was pretty amazing. We've never actually ended with one minute to go, but uh, you really <laughs> took command of all those questions and I'm going to be saving uh, all those messages and I'll send them over to you as well. So thank you very much. Um, and we'll be back yeah. in touch and we have your information also for students and faculty to contact you as well. So thank you. Okay. Thanks. Take care. All.